I went to graduate school in molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley. And when I started graduate school, I had no idea what I would eventually end up doing. Um, I ended up doing rotations in a variety of different labs, um, from immunology to yeast genetics, and eventually I ended up uh, looking at um, recombination, genetic recombination in um, neurons. Uh, I fell in love with neuroscience when I was a graduate student, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, for my postdoctoral work, I, I went to a, a couple different places. I was interested in um, how people understood neural activity in vivo, and so I um, spent a, a brief uh, amount of time in the UK working with Kevin Fox, looking at single unit uh, responses to sensory input. And then I moved back to California to Stanford University, where I was a postdoc with Rob Malenka. At my postdoc at Stanford, um, I learned how to do uh, whole cell recording, um, electrophysiology, and acute brain slices. And that was a really exciting technique because uh, the data we collect is real time. And so you can see what's happening in a living cell um, when you give it some little stimulus or something, you can see the cell spike. And so it's really very um, uh, dynamic. You know, you start the experiment and you're completely engaged in um, what that neuron is doing at a given time. I was really excited about coming to Carnegie Mellon because of the kind of department that it was. It was uh, very um, cross-disciplinary in many respects. A lot of different kinds of science going on here that really complemented the work that I wanted to do. I work with transgenic mice, um, and I'm very interested in how neurons are altered by experience. So we work with the animals um, that have specific behavioral or sensory experiences, and then we look at the neurons that have been altered by those specific experiences. Um, uh, in, in acute brain slices, so we can then identify very specific regions of the brain that have been altered, and we can patch clamp um, and record responses from those neurons that might have been altered by some um, experience. Um, so there's a really close connection between the in vivo and the mouse, and then the analysis, which is typically electrophysiological, although we do use some molecular techniques. Um, the lab has developed a number of uh, transgenic tools to image neural activity, um, specifically gene expression. So we take advantage of the fact that neurons express an immediate early gene called FOSS when they've been very active. And we've developed different reporters uh, to visualize these specific uh, cells so we can identify the right cells in a field of unlabeled cells. We can see these fluorescently active cells. Um, they're either green or we have a new transgenic now that makes them red. Some specific uh, projects that the students have been working on lately are um, analysis of how a particular potassium channel um, is regulated by activity. And we've been specifically focused on BK channels, which are the large conductance potassium channels. They're gated by calcium and voltage. And we think that there's some really interesting cell biology uh, things that are going on. So, for example, this channel seems like it's being trafficked differentially to the cell surface of the plasma membrane, depending on whether a neuron has been recently active or not. There's also some changes in gene expression that are associated with BK channel regulation. We're very involved in, in examining that. Another project that the student's been working on that I think is very interesting is to look at how sensory changes, how experience-dependent plasticity is manifested in terms of synaptic changes. So synapses are the connections between one neuron and another neuron. And we've been able to identify in the brain that synaptic connections can become strengthened after some sort of sensory experience. Now the interesting thing is that when you and I learn something, we don't need to practice it forever to remember it. And what we're finding in sensory cortex is that there are critical periods for how this sensory information is encoded into the synaptic strength during early development. And after that, continuing input is not required in order to maintain these changes in synaptic strength. So a student in the lab currently um, has been looking at how um, whisker-dependent plasticity is manifested both in its initial phases and then after longer periods of, of um, whisker um, stimulation or even in the absence of the whiskers themselves, how are these synaptic changes maintained? The majority of my lab has been uh, powered by graduate students and I'll have one or two postdocs at any given time. I also have a technician who helps take care of the animals and uh, she helps people uh, with various sorts of in vivo techniques that they might uh, need to use, such as whisker stimulation, 
since we study sensory cortex, um, or uh, we also have uh, a number of people in the lab who are studying epilepsy um, and need to generate seizures or are looking at genetically susceptible animals uh, that experience spontaneous seizures. Rotation students will typically start off doing some sort of histology or molecular biology um, or occasionally some patch plant analysis where they're looking at um, action potentials or um, some um, electrophysiological data. But eventually, everybody in the lab is using whole cell patch clamp recording or single unit recordings in vivo. And I think that in general, everybody who starts doing these sorts of experiments is completely captivated by how exciting it is to capture real time data um, in a living animal or in a living neuron. So the bulk of the work that's done here is done using these electrophysiological techniques. Many students will also complement these techniques using biochemical analysis or gene expression analysis or overexpression analysis in heterologous cells of a particular molecule, molecule that we come, become interested in. I'm very interested in moving into a little bit more animal behavior um, or in vivo analysis in the behaving animals. And we're just setting up um, some in vivo whole cell imaging and recording uh, techniques here. Um, I'm also very excited about using some um, a direct analysis of RNA um, species uh, using some non-amplification techniques to evaluate how RNA uh, levels can change with a specific stimulus in very small subsets of cells. In this case, we would be extracting the RNA from individual neurons or very small populations of neurons perhaps those neurons that have been defined by their activity-dependent gene expression um, after some in vivo stimulus. Of course, we will also continue to do synaptic an analysis of synaptic properties um, in uh, specific circuits and pathways in the cerebral cortex. Most of the students who come, in my, come to my lab don't have a lot of experience in neuroscience. And I don't consider this to be a, 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 an enormous problem. Although it does mean that they need to take some neuroscience courses in their first year to sort of get up to speed. Um, graduate studies in a particular subdiscipline like neuroscience are really fundamentally dependent upon the kinds of techniques that we have available. And anybody who's done some research and is experienced in designing experience and experiments and answering scientific questions, I think can make the transition pretty easily. Um, the kinds of experiments we do, though, are really based in a long tradition of studies um, of learning and memory, for example, of cortical processing, um, and of cell-cell interactions at the level of synaptic function. Um, all my students have been members of the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition, which is an outstanding group, interdisciplinary group, between the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University of other neuroscientists. And this is very interdisciplinary from statistics, psychology, robotics, um, and biomedical engineering. Um, and that gives people a very broad overview of the kinds of questions people are asking in brain science today. Although the sorts of experiments that we do in my lab are quite reductionist in terms of molecular approaches and in terms of single cell analysis, um, that experience interacting with other neuroscientists at a very broad level is extremely helpful. My students publish their work in the highest quality neuroscience journals typically the journals Neuroscience, Neuron, and Science. We also have published papers in open access journals like BMC Neuroscience or Neurobiology of Disease, uh, which is another outstanding journal for more specialized work, uh, such as in the epilepsy field. I typically go to three or four conferences a year. Uh, the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting is an excellent conference for both investigators and students and postdocs. Um, and the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition uh, provides some, re some travel money for my students to visit at least one conference a year. Um, as my students become more advanced, I find um, it's excellent training for them to go to a more specialized conference, such as a Gordon conference or a Cold Spring Harbor meeting, uh, which is a little bit more intimate. Instead of thousands of members, there are typically several hundred members. My lab has collaborated with a number of different labs, both at Carnegie Mellon and also in other institutions. Um, I have very close colleagues in Berlin and Germany who I've been doing in vivo whole cell recording. And we will continue to collaborate looking at how sensory representations are differentially uh, distributed across populations of cells in the neocortex. Um, that collaboration has been very fruitful and I continue to go back and have people from Berlin visit my lab. 
Um, I also have a very close collaborator in the United Kingdom who has come to the lab uh, periodically um, over the past seven or eight years, and he will come for a month or two uh, to do experiments, and it's been great to have him around. Within the department, there are a number of people who I interact with. Um, Marcel Boucher um, in the Molecular Biome Sensor and Imaging Center has developed some really great molecular tools for us to image channel trafficking. We're starting to do some of this in vivo um, in living neurons and hopefully in um, living animals. I've had a number of students and graduate students who've left the lab. My graduate students have been very successful at going to excellent postdocs. So my first graduate student is now um, at Johns Hopkins uh, studying um, glutamate receptors with a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, um, Rick Huguenier. Um, recently, this past year, I've had two graduate students who've graduated. Sonal Shruti is now at Brandeis uh, working with Eve Martyr, who's really a leader in the field uh, looking at ion channel expression and neural activity. Um, Brett Benedetti graduated just this past um, uh, fall. Um, Brett Benedetti has moved to NYU where he's a, a postdoctoral fellow in Gord Fischel's lab looking at um, interneuron development. I think one of the unique things about Carnegie Mellon is that the small graduate program here means the faculty are very invested in the success of their students. And I can tell you that the students in my lab are very successful, in part because the student-faculty ratio is rather low, the labs tend to be small, and there's a lot of attention that's um, provided for each individual student. I need my student to be successful. Nobody falls through the cracks. They get a lot of instruction and guidance in terms of their projects that they're starting out, and I'm delighted to see how they can prosper um, under these relatively um, intimate uh, laboratory settings.